not everything hooked up again, is it? Yep. Oh, oh yeah. You're right. Take the stool out. I got it. It should be stuck right on your rug. Uh, I got you, buddy. Unit. Okay. <laughs> you got it. Yep. Thanks, Mark. As soon as you get us a rundown, then we can stay with us. Okay. All right. That's for you. Thanks, Greg. I'm sorry for you. Here. Doc, move right before Kim takes your spot. <laughs> Not worried about that, my friend. Can you turn that down a little bit? Oh, you're killing me. Okay, everybody's wired. Everybody's yeah, wired. and then some. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm on my spot, Can Baba. That's really loud. Huh. Get on your spot and get off of Hold mine. On. Yep. Mm-hmm. Sure. Goes to Steve Burns at the end. Okay. For the past couple of hours here on the Superstation, the sanction and direction of the Pocono International Raceway has been in the hands of the Automobile Racing Club of America. And now, the 43 champions of Winston Cup Racing who have qualified for tomorrow's 26th annual $2 million Pennsylvania 500 are suited up and ready to come out here and make those final checks, just those little tweaks that can make the difference in winning a Winston Cup race. At the highest level of stock car racing, it is Winston Cup. There you see Jeff Gordon, defending champion, getting ready to see what he can do here. And the pole sitter for tomorrow, Mike Skinner of Susanville, California, with Larry McReynolds. And they'll be together for the next three years, one of the big announcements of the weekend. And here's the number six, and what a dramatic story here. A broken wrist, a broken kneecap, bruised ribs. That doesn't stop Arkansas's Mark Martin as he gets ready to come out here, and what a show he will be putting on tomorrow in the course of 500 miles. Hello again. Ken Squire welcoming you back as we get to happy hour. Last chance to massage. You don't want to over-massage. You just want to be spot on. When you hit that starting line tomorrow about 105, we'll be with you at 1235 tomorrow, and we're looking forward to your company as we get ready for this great race. Let's go right down to Steve Burns quickly. Hey, Ken, Rusty Wallace will join our broadcast team, but first things first, he's going to go out and practice. Tell us what we're going to see at happy hour here, Rusty, on behalf of all the drivers. Uh, you're going to see a lot of spring changing going on, a lot, a lot of shock absorbers, air pressure adjustments, and you might see some guys just go out and their cars are right, right off the bat, then they'll be doing long runs. I hope that's the way my car is. We put a different spring package in the front of our car, trying something that will help the front end stick a little better, and so we'll see what happens. If it doesn't work, you'll see a lot of spring changing going on. All right, Rusty, thanks for joining us. Let's go back upstairs. Thank you very much. Here's Dick Bergen. He's been covering races for, oh, much longer than I've been around. <laughs> That's a lie. Listen, we get down to happy hour at Pennsylvania. 26 years ago, they came to this race. Buddy Baker was on the pole, 144. Remember those cars as big as bread boxes? Huh? 
Well, they're a whole lot more aerodynamic right now, and this is the most important time of the entire weekend to get all of these cars dialed in. Rusty told you about the spring changes. They're also going to be checking on fuel to see how far they can go, and fuel is always a critical factor here at Pocono. So, to Buddy Baker, how about getting dialed in? When you were here 26 years ago, and you put that number 15, that Norris Industries car for Bud Moore on the pole, was there as much of this preparation and all this as we see today? Not at all. Uh, one thing we didn't have, we didn't take the cars to the wind tunnel. We didn't do a lot of things they do now. Balance is so cru crucial to getting around and, and keeping the speeds up. Air pressure. One pound air pressure in the tire, as much as 50 pounds change on the spring of the car. So it's so very technical now, and the guys have to be perfect to really race here anymore. 26 years ago, they came right down to the finish. It was Richard Petty and Buddy Baker, and that time Petty got you. Oh, you had to bring that up. <laughs> Let me tell you something about these cars. Second, though. third, and second when he first raced, for years. They didn't even have air in the oh, tires. That's it. All right, let's get ready and get down on the track. They're lining up the cars to come out here, and I think Tony Stewart. There you see him in the car. What a story he is in 1999. The outstanding rookie is getting ready to see if he can win his first race in Winston Cup. And how about Bobby Labonte? The Joe Gibbs Pontiac, that's going to be a tough one. Remember, he won last time here back in June, and Bobby Labonte is having just a magnificent season in the Interstate Batteries Pontiac. He's rolling out. They're all coming onto the speedway, ladies and gentlemen. Mike Skinner is pulling out. What a story there. Won at Japan, had a bitter disappointment at Talladega earlier this year. Now he looks like he's really ready to go. And here comes the one they'll either cheer for or boo for, Jeff Gordon who has done as much to elevate stock car racing as anyone these days, brought a whole new generation in, and a lot of folks would just as soon see him further back in the field. All of these stories to be covered tomorrow as the greatest stock car drivers in the world, the stars of the Winston Cup. See those fans? Some of them have sat there all day waiting for just a chance to see them roll by, and perhaps if they walk by, get an autograph here at Pocono. Happy hour on its way. Okay, I'm back. Oh. Yeah. Thanks. You knew I wasn't going to let him slide on that, didn't you? You knew I wasn't going to let Ken get by with that. Okay. Thank you. Oh, God, he's going downhill now. No, he's getting I'm getting... No, he's getting bananas now. Can I have the yes, Winston sir. Cup stuff, Skeeter? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Absolutely. That'd be a great time to do it. That's in the open, right? Tell me the three shots again. Okay. 71 ends it. Who's the first interview with? I, th I heard Jeff Gordon. Back with you at Pocono, Pennsylvania. There you see them lined up, ready for happy hour to commence on the two and a half mile Pocono Raceway. Mark Martin. He may be beaten, battered, but he's first out. What a gutsy story he is. Jeff Gordon rolls the 24. And here comes Earnhardt. He knows what it is to win here at Pocono, Pennsylvania. Did it in one of the most dramatic finishes I've ever seen in racing when he honored a fallen comrade, Davey Allison. 
All coming up tomorrow, starting at 12.35 on the Superstation. It's the Pennsylvania 500. And defending champion Jeff Gordon do it. And what about this man? Mark Martin in number six, crashing at Daytona in practice. Kneecap broken, wrist broken, ribs bruised. That will not stop a hero like Mark Martin. And Mike Skinner's on the pole tomorrow. And right here, as they go through that corner, that's going to be trouble tomorrow for sure. It was for Dave Marcus just a few weeks back. He walked away from that 170 mile an hour impact. All right, they're set and ready here. Happy hour is underway, and let's talk for just a moment about what it all means. When they're out here in this final time to primp and prepare for tomorrow, what are you looking for? Well, as they said, they're checking fuel mileage. They're also checking the balance of the car. They may make a spring change. They may change the sway bar. Just critiquing what they have right now, making it better, making it be good for 500 miles. Now, why, particularly here with these three different corners, all bank different, all angle different, it must put a great deal of stress on what these mechanics do to engineer these cars for race. Well, the mechanics can't get the car perfect for all three of those turns, so the deal right now in happy hour will be to come up with the best possible compromise so that if you're not doing so well in one turn, you've got the other two turns well enough so you can pass cars and get terrific lap times. A lot of pressure on the garage area mechanics as this happy hour unfolds. Defending champion Jeff Gordon in the number 24, down into turn number one. And looking there. <laughs> Look at Earnhardt on the bottom already. He's feeling racy, and he should. He's got his best non-restrictor plate start of the whole year right here at Pocono for tomorrow's race. Earnhardt likes to win everything, including practice. <laughs> He yeah. ducks back there, though. He wants to see what his car is like behind Jeff Gordon's car. He dropped back about four or five car lengths. Now he wants to see if he can close down on him. Well, he also didn't want to stick Gordon on the high side going through that tunnel turn. That's a pretty rough place to be upstairs going through that corner. Let's go to Randy Pemberton. Well, I can tell you guys, uh, Crew Chief Ray Evernham for Jeff Gordon was all over the radio just moments ago, and I can understand why anytime you're near Earnhardt. Here's the bottom line. I just spoke with Jeff Gordon in the garage area before he rolled out. I asked him how his car was. He said, we were absolutely junked this morning. We had some radical stuff underneath the car trying to make it work. It didn't work. So what they did is they've gone back to the basics. They, Jeff feels that they're uh, much better suited for this racetrack run right now. One thing he also said was, that the rubber on the racetrack from the prior race, the Arca race, it's Hoosier rubber, which means that they don't quite know how the Goodyear Eagle radio is going to react to that. So they want to run quite a few laps to get a feel for it before they make any changes whatsoever. Those Hoosier tires, they're run by the Automobile Racing Club of America. Now all of these cars are Goodyear shot. Exactly, and the compound is different on, on each tire. And the Hoosier probably is a little harder compound tire, and the rubber is different on the racetrack, so they slide across the racetrack until they get it blended in. And that's one of the reasons that the tail end of this happy hour will be so extremely important. By then, the Hoosier rubber will be gone, the good ru Goodyear rubber will be down, and this racetrack will be closest to the way the racetrack will be at the conclusion of tomorrow's Pennsylvania 500. And that's the whole ball game here. Get the car set up so it'll be as fast as possible, not at the beginning of the race, at the end of the race. Two million dollars at stake in the Pennsylvania 500. 26 annual running tomorrow. Hope you'll be here to enjoy it with us. Back in a moment. Ah. Starting lineup. Uh, look, 43. I think it'd be a good time to do it while they're out there, and then whatever interviews. Look who's the fastest car right now. Ward. Ward Burton. Yep. I'm Point. telling you, he's going to win here one of these days. We're ready on anybody. Yeah, pole sitter. You're in our house there, now. <laughs> we know him. More or less. Okay. Big story this week. That could be told from here or the pits. Yeah. Great. Okay. Is he on the track or back in the garage? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Skeeter. 
Can you find out what channel NASCAR is on? Two, three, four. Boy, the sun's out. This is perfect. Look at the blue sky. Mm -hmm. So much for rain today. Yeah. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Again, off again out here on the track. Hamilton, Stewart, Benson, Michael Waltrip just getting out here on the track and now back to the uh, pit area as we continue in this final opportunity to check your cars out for tomorrow. Now the pole sitter, Mike Skinner. The pole sitter is back in the garage area and we believe a story is developing. Let's get to Mike Hogwood. Well, the story is, Ken, this morning they were really down on the speed charts. Mike told me earlier today that they were hoping not to put their race motor in, but they put the race motor in. And uh, does that present any problems to you, Larry McReynolds, the crew chief? No, we just, you know, for a 500 mile race here at Pocono, the RPMs get up there so high and stay there so long. We just wanted to make sure we didn't put a lot of miles on our race motor, so we waited a happy hour to put it in. They wanted to run it three or four laps, get a plug check, go make a little adjustment on the car itself, and uh, just try to keep the miles down on happy hour. This is probably one of the better race motors we've had all year as far as on the dyno. Now we got to see about the racetrack. It seemed to be tough, though, on your driver this morning to win the pole and then come in and not being able to run as fast as he wanted to. He was anxious to get that race motor in the car. Well, again, our guys have worked awfully hard on our race motor stuff, so we just we didn't want to keep the qualifying engine in there so we just kind of stuck a work motor in there just to kind of work on the car but uh, should be a lot quicker with this motor. Larry you had a news conference the other day there had been a lot of talk you may go out and start your own team but you're back you're with uh, Mike Skinner Richard Childress now for the next three years. Yeah pretty excited about that you know a little disappointed we didn't get the new race team done but uh, John and I the, the gentleman I was working with on it John Daler we always agreed that if we couldn't do it right we didn't want to do it just to get in this garage here and be car owners and we run past our deadline, and I wasn't out there hunting another crew chief job. If I could do the ownership deal, great, but if I couldn't get it done, then right here with this Lowe's team be just, just fine. And after signing the agreement, putting it on the pole, that's a pretty good start. Yeah, I guess we need to hold a press conference every qualifying day. Maybe that was the hot <laughs> ticket. <laughs> it was. Larry McReynolds will let you get back to work with your driver. Appreciate him being with us. And, of course, the race motor now in the car for the 31, Mike Skinner, the pole sitter. Now, what's the story here? Here's Dale Jarrett, number 88. Yeah, and he's pointing the wrong way up pit road there. Uh, he should be pointed out towards the racetrack there, so he has a problem. You see the hood up. This is the number one man in Winston Cup points, the winner of that Pepsi 400 this year at Daytona in that sensational battle that ended a couple of laps shy. He came across. Everybody is still saying, what if they'd run all the way to the green? What Earnhardt would have taken, and would you run out of fuel? A lot of woodies and butts on that one, huh, Dick? Well, yeah, right now the woody and butt is about why that hood is up in the automobile. They've only had one DNF this year, and that's a, a good reason that this team is on top of the points right now. They have been incredibly reliable. They have stayed out of trouble. <laughs> and here comes the crew, and they are in a hurry to get down there and try and find out what's wrong with that car, fix it so that DJ can get back out and get some laps. Now there is another major story developing this morning. When they were coming out to qualify, Elliot Sadler, out of Virginia, in the Wood Brothers, number 21, hammered the wall. He has broken a foot. And the number 21 is uh, over there in the uh, pit area now. And as to who's in that car and the rest of the story, let's go to Randy. Yes, Elliot Sadler sitting in here in his backup car for now. Uh, there you get a good shot of him. He, he is a little bit sore from this morning. He hurt his left foot. Now, he is going to practice this backup car, try and get it tweaked in. If he is too sore to go, Morgan Shepard, a former driver for the Wood Brothers and the Sitco team, will climb aboard for the final 15 minutes. 
Now, I'll have you know, a backup car, it takes a long time to get these things set up for a Winston Cup race. They have struggled all weekend long. They've blown a couple of engines, wrecked the race car, and Elliot Sadler, their Rookie of the Year contender driver, is now hurt, but he's in the car right now. You lose the primary car. You lose the primary car, Buddy Baker, and then when you get ready to come out here with only an hour, the question to you after we take this commercial break will be, how do you really get ready? Okay, I'm ready. We'll come back. I'm excited. Uh, let me finish what he just said when we come back. Yeah, I'll, I'll make it quick. I lost him. Yeah, and they're pushing it, the whole crew. Need to show that whole crew pushing and running. Okay. And then we want to know why they're pushing it. Mm -hmm. Point lead 240. Thank you. Oh, you got one of those. Oh, see, you're fancy. You're an important person. I know it. <clears throat> Left feet really catch it, don't they? You know why? Okay, and then... Thank you. Okay, thanks. This is more important first. Yes. He is to start 15th tomorrow. They just rolled his car off pit road back way. He was way down toward the exit of pit road. They rolled it backwards up. It's in there now. We're going to have Dale Jarrett's number 88 leading the Winston Cup points. It's a gear problem. That's the gear right there that they're holding out. They're taking the axles out of the back of the car right now. So they had a gear problem with the AD8 car. And we'll be following that story in this hour and trying to get more on it for you. Let's go to Steve Burns. And Ken, this team is very busy underneath the rear end of this car. They have another transmission sitting by. So I think it may be more than just a gear. They may have to change the entire <laughs> rear end underneath this number 88 of Dale Jarrett. Well, it's not unusual when you have a gear problem that the transmission also has a problem, and sometimes the transmission can fail and cause the rear end gear problem. With the lack of time, the reason they're changing the gear right now, they eliminate the problem. They're probably putting the same gear ratio back in there, but also changing transmission so they know they don't have a problem with either one. You had this happen to your car at home, it'd be in the service station for what, about, oh, about four? a week? <laughs> yeah, about a week. These guys will get this thing done in time to get the car back on the racetrack again before happy hour is over. Of which there's about 45 minutes remaining. Yep, draining the oil out of it. Here's the new gear set, the foreground that'll be going into the race car. There it is right there. Now, while this story is developing, and we'll come back to it, let's go over to the Wood Brothers, number 21, where Elliot Sadler is waiting an opportunity to come back on the track and readdress with Buddy Baker the situation where he has destroyed his primary car. He was taken to the hospital, flown out of here. They say he has a broken ankle. He's in there. He's got a secondary car, which he's got to shake down. That's got to put you in a very tough spot. Buddy. Well, it is a tough spot, but the Wood Brothers know a lot about this racetrack, so they know the setups, and they have good... Uh stuff to go back on as far as springs, gear, and everything else. The big question is, with uh, Elliot Sadler with the left foot hurt, and you do shift here, that is a problem for him. And uh, with Morgan Shepard standing by, he drove for the Wood Brothers, that would make a perfect combination. 
provisional starter. He'll come from 40th position tomorrow, this outstanding youngster from Virginia. And let's go down and get a word with him now. Well, he's trying to get ready to come out. Crew still working on the car. We'll grab him real quick. How are you feeling, Elliot? Feeling pretty good right now. My, my foot's a little sore. I banged it up pretty good. Just uh, trying to get the sit go forward in the field pretty solidly. And it came, you know, I just got in there too hard and come around on me. Just feel sorry for these guys. They really worked hard this weekend. Seemed like we've been behind the eight ball a lot, but uh, hopefully things will turn around for us tomorrow. We're getting the car pretty comfortable, this backup car, and I think we'll be okay tomorrow. Okay, good luck to you. That eight ball is as big as Mars. They've blown two engines. They've destroyed one car. Elliot Sadler has his work cut out. One thing to think about, they may just run trans or rear and gear ratio where he does not have to shift with that foot problem, so he may not have that big a problem. On the speedway, here is Mike Skinner, who put it on the pole at over 170 miles per hour, and you're riding with him. take you through the field tomorrow. That right there is the uh, one and only. That's the Valvoline car of Mark Martin. And what a story that's going to be when we get down to showtime tomorrow. Outside of the front row, only two cars went over 170 miles per hour. And it's Skinner and Martin up front for that 500 start here in the 26th annual Pennsylvania 500. There's row two. And there you've got Kenny Schrader and Bobby Labonte. Buddy, take a look at row three. John Andretti, great track driver Wally Dahlenbach excellent on road course and also very good on super speedway here's Jeff Gordon ready to go and you watch this kid Ward Burton tomorrow in the number 22 car he is consistently strong here at Pocono Sterling Marlin he has the record for this track he'll be fun to watch and Joe Nemechek this now look at this row six I well, love this one. <laughs> this next row Dale Earnhardt the intimidator, Tony Stewart, the big story this year. Rookie has been up front, led many races, but has not won yet. Yet. Rich Bickle and Terry Labonte are row seven for the 500. As to row eight, there you've got Dale Jarrett and Michael Waltrip. In row nine tomorrow, it's Rusty Wallace and Jeff Burton. For row 10, Kenny Irwin and Jeremy Mayfield are there. In row 11, Jimmy Spencer, the pride of Pennsylvania, and Rick Mass. In row 12, that's where we're going to start. Ted Musgrave from Wisconsin, California's Ernie Irvin. Row 13, it's Dave Marcus back after that hellacious crash in June and Brett Bodine. Row 14 will be Bobby Hamilton and Kenny Wallace, second at New Hampshire the last time out. Row 15, Hutt Strickland of Alabama, Stanton Barrett of California. Row 16, Kevin LePage from Vermont. And Northport, New York, Steve Park. Row 17, Robert Presley and Johnny Benson. Row 18 for the Pennsylvania 500, Ricky Rudd. And Owensboro, Kentucky's David Green. Row 19, Bill Elliott and Chad Lewis. In row 20, you have Kyle Petty and Elliott Sadler in those provisional positions with Jerry Nadeau and Jeffrey Bodine. Rounding out the field, taking a champion's provisional is Darrell Waldrip. 12.35 will join you tomorrow. About 1.05, they'll crank them up for big time racing. More happy hour coverage coming up for you shortly. Robert, Robert Gates standing right there watching the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And looking at his watch. Yep. That's important. That's why I pointed that out, why you they're bet. changing all that stuff. but you just watch what I'm telling you. Stewart's right up there in the top mm -hmm. 10. I want to 
talk with you about the business of driving hurt. Driving hurt, mm -hmm. which I did. Well, which every, but I want you to really tell me why, you know, people say, gee whiz, other sports, they make them sit out for a while. It's part of the business. You drive. Yeah. Yeah. Two. Good. You okay, so just to give me 10 seconds on him, that's all. start to get the points. That's mm -hmm. how simple that is. <laughs> yep. I mean, yeah. it, 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 and how you put pain to work. Yeah. If I can follow up about the NASCAR rule about that, you've got to get yourself exhaust, in this car. Exhaust noise. Yep. Indiana's Tony Stewart's on the track. He's averaging 164.555. That's 10th quickest. Who's quickest in this happy hour? How about number 22, Ward Burton at 165.502. Let's go to the garage area and see what's happening with him. Ward's sitting in the car and he's not been totally happy even though he's the fastest guy on the racetrack right now. How about it, Ward? Well, Caterpillar team's working awful hard. I got a great car here. I'm just trying to get a little bit more comfortable in the long run and uh, you know, it's a little bit different when you're out there by yourself. You got a couple of guys around you versus having a guy on the inside, outside, behind you, and in front of you. So, uh, trying to get the car a little bit more stable, and so it'll be fast in the long run. What exactly are they doing the car to make it more stable for you out there on the track? Uh, we changed some rear springs. We changed some uh, some downforce angles on the front of the nose, and that's just a start. I expect we're going to be changing some more here shortly. And they're getting ready to fire the motor, so we're going to back out of here. We're going back for some more laps. He was the pole sitter in 1998. He'll start eighth in the Pennsylvania 500 tomorrow. He's one of the quietest, easiest guys off the racetrack you could think of. Loves the out of doors, loves to spend time hunting and fishing, does a lot of environmental work down there in Virginia, but put him on a racetrack, and you got a tiger by the tail. Here's Jeff Gordon's number 24. He's been turning some good laps at 165, 147. Going back, Jimmy Irwin Jr. as they head for the tunnel turn. Continuing to shake them out here. Burton has been quick. Martin second, Mayfield third. Speech rules really don't count for that much. You know, Ken, a lot of people don't understand why Mark Martin's out there with a broken wrist and a broken kneecap. The reason for that, you have to start to get the points. And they also, when they start racing, their mind goes to how good they can run on the racetrack. And the pain goes away, believe me. The, the issue is the pain. I mean, you hear about athletes getting hurt, and they're out one or two weeks. And this, this guy in 21, Sadler, broke a foot this morning. He hammered the wall at 170 miles an hour, and he's out here practicing. Well, it's so important to stay in the game, and uh, you just Blank it out. I did it many a time. You just have to forget your pain and go and do your job. And I asked Jeff Gordon about exactly that yesterday because he was sick, sick as a dog at Sears Point earlier this year. And, you know, he was so sick he couldn't even talk to his crew in the car, yet he won the race. And what he said is, you never know when the next race is going to be the last one you can win. And so you run every race you possibly can, particularly when you have a good car. And for tomorrow, Mark Martin has got a terrific car, a car that's absolutely capable of winning the event. I think Mark Martin's going to stay in that race car all day long, run the whole 500 miles, as hurt as he is. We'll talk about Jeff Gordon for a moment. Now let's go back to Sunday. Jeff Gordon had kind of a bump and run Sunday up at New Hampshire. Jeff Gordon here, there at New Hampshire. Jeff Gordon into the side of Rusty Wallace in the number two, midway through the race. And at the end here with Dale Jarrett in a duel for third. What's all that about, Things Jeff? Things happen in racing. I've, I've been in racing for a long, long time, and uh, I've gotten the bad end of it. I've been on the good end of it. Uh, uh, you know, there, there are times when contact is made out there, and, and uh, the last thing I ever want to do is just intentionally go out there and, and hit a guy. But there are times when you've got to put your foot down and say, hey, listen, you know, uh, I came here to race really, really hard. And, uh, you know, sometimes racing really hard can get you in incidences like that. 
Well, and that's exactly the way the ball works here. Uh, if you're going to be a winner, sometimes you're going to have to stick your nose in there, and once in a while, somebody's going to get mad at you. That's all there is to it. I just feel like if everybody spoke to me when I walked through the garage area, I wasn't doing my job properly. <laughs> With that, we'll go to commercial and then return once again to Pocono Raceway. Everybody feels still the same today about Buddy, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Ken, that's the truth. No, you're if you're the most popular guy in the garage area, yeah, you got a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, -do -do. I heard him laugh in the truck on that one. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah, that's important. Uh, I don't see him. Hold on. Well, he won't be getting it. He's on the other side of the garage. He told me yesterday the hardest part was getting in and out of the car. Yeah. That was tougher than driving. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Can I have that chair back? Can I hey, have Squire. Chair? Squire. Yeah. Why do you feel you have to second up me? Uh, you made a comment they feel the same way up here. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I figured it'd be worth a restorative after the race is over. <laughs> It is. <laughs> Let me fix it. <laughs> Anything you want. You got that script on Mark Martin? He may have won 30 Winston Cup races, but the most important for Mark Martin is always the next one, and he will go after it from outside of the front row when they start the Pennsylvania 500 shortly after 1 o'clock tomorrow. Mark Martin had this crash in practice three weeks ago at Daytona. One of NASCAR's most durable warriors, battered, bruised, ribs torn up, tough guy. That's what he's wearing, and the hardest part is getting him in and out of that car. They have two guys that lift him up and set him in there. He's going to the doctor Monday on his wrist. He thinks that's pretty well over with as far as his uh, left wrist, but it's, uh, he said it would be a couple of months with his knee. They put a new screw in his knee this week, right? Yeah, and he says, you know, that's the long, that'll be for the long haul. He's a left foot breaker, and that's the knee that's broken is the left knee. And that's probably going to give him the most trouble here tomorrow at Pocono, using that left foot to break the race car. And and that's where they you see so many guys get broken feet, right, buddy? Is If, if you break with your left foot out here, and, and many do. Uh, you, you can tell yourself all you want to when the tire goes flat. Don't touch the brake because you can still steer it on the end of line or tire that you have. But you know what? You'll grab that brake in spite of it. 200 miles an hour, you're going to hit the brake. He's standing up on his left knee when he hit the wall there, and that's what broke his knee. Now, you're watching him shift here, but he's not using that left leg to shift the car. These transmissions are such that they can shift without using a clutch. All manual transmissions, but clutchless. They haven't fixed a brake like that, Jim. No, they have not, and they're not power brakes either. They're mechanical brakes, and they take some power to push them and make them work. Now, here he comes into that critical tunnel turn. Got to be down right there. So right through there. What a dramatic story it would be if Mark Martin wins this 26th annual
Pennsylvania 500 tomorrow afternoon. Well, it shouldn't surprise anybody. Two weeks ago at New Hampshire, he was in much worse shape. He started 37th, finished 6th. He passed 31 healthy drivers on the way to the checkered flag. And got out of the car and apologized to the crew. He says, I had the car to win with. Physically, I wasn't prepared for what I went through that day. But, hey, 6th place, I wouldn't apologize. Be fun to follow that G-load on his head here, buddy. You could talk about that. I mean, well, that's like wearing a bowling ball up here. Yeah, right here you can see that. Uh, you put your head against that through the corner. There's so much G-force in the corner. You wouldn't believe how the body tries to come off the seat. And also, if he didn't have that, it'd make his neck very tired in 500 miles. We should also point out that there's a NASCAR ruling that when a driver is injured, he's got to be able to get himself in and out of the car by himself. And he's got to have a doctor's release in order to be able to participate. Now, the crew is loading Mark in and taking him back out because that's just the easier way to do it. But if he had to, he could get himself in and out. You see, he has a very unusual driving style also. He uses his right arm, puts it way over on the left side. The reason for that, he was a small guy when he first started racing. He needed both hands to turn without power steering, and he started his driving career like that, and he's never went away from it. Although now he's probably the most physically fit driver in the whole field, but he does not change what works. Works out an incredible amount of time. All right, let's go to Steve Burns. All right, thanks, guys. We've been watching Dale Jarrett. The team is working extremely hard on the race car. Dale, tell your fans what exactly the guy's doing. Our cameras have been watching you. It looks like serious business. I don't know exactly. We broke something in the rear end. Uh, first lap out on the racetrack, so they've just uh, been replacing everything that uh, messed up. Is it a matter of just trying to be cautious to make sure that everything is replaced? Well, hey, yeah, they're just doing the normal job that would be done at any time when we have a problem like this. So it uh, just takes a little while to get everything uh, done. Uh, you have to take care of the coolers in the rear end and make sure everything's cleaned up from uh, the previous problem. Mr. Cool, Dale Jarrett, 240 point advantage, but he doesn't need any problems tomorrow in the Pennsylvania 500. Sure. How am I going to do it? What have I got to do? No. Yes, yes. I do. I didn't know I had it. <laughs> there it is. Voila. Yeah, when he stops, I don't mind talking to him. I'd ask him track, you know, what the condition of the racetrack is. and They just said it's programmed for ARCA still. Oh, it's still programmed for ARCA. I can't do it. Okay, good. Yeah. I, I know I don't, I don't want to see him. Yeah, and I hope to get an interview with him. Go to start third. That's pretty good. We can talk about him. We have Yeah, stuff. if you could get those other guys that are in the <laughs> top five, like Schrader, Bobby Labonte, and John Andretti, Wally Dahlenbeck, that would be so great. Also, we need to follow up on Sadler's how he feels after he gets done with 21. The Schrader? Yeah. Why don't he want to talk? I don't know. That doesn't matter. Can I have the Schrader card? Okay. Okay. Pocono, Pennsylvania is the site. Pennsylvania 500's the event. And tomorrow, $2 million is at stake. Ken Schrader will start in third position tomorrow, having qualified at 169. He's had his shares of ups and downs in his 16-year career. Sonoma, California was both 
Things look better for Schrader today, starting on that second row than they did at Sears Point last time that he was out on that road course. Yeah, that was called a safety wall, but two cars got upside down on it. Hey, Schrader's really, really good here at Pocono. He's won the pole for this race or for races here at Pocono five separate times. He's done just about everything except win. He's been second, he's been third. And boy, he's had some big wrecks here. He had a big one in June of 1998. And a lot of people say he's the most active driver out there. He runs about 100 events a year, just loves to race on any surface anywhere. Steve Burns is over in the Rusty Wallace garage. Let's check in there. Well, Rusty, we talked to you before practice, and you talked about spring shocks. Tell us what you've changed. Tell us about the racetrack. Well, the racetrack's in good shape. I've changed a lot of stuff. I'm too tight right now in turn one, a little too loose in turn three, which is not a good combination to have. We're working on it right now to try to fix that. It's easy to fix one corner, but at Pocono, you got three, and it's hard to negotiate them all. We'll get it. Rusty Wallace. He has been 11th quickest out here today. He's going to join us at the end of the hour. Perhaps get an interview with some of the other folks around. Finished a third back here in 1990. Won this race in 1996 as he did in 1991. Well, here's the one everybody's talking about, as they always do. He has made himself one of the greatest drivers of the 20th century. Seven-time Winston Cup champion Dale Earnhardt, Kannapolis, North Carolina. This is the kind of track where he can do real good, as they say. <laughs> 1982 on this very racetrack, Dale Earnhardt had a big moment. Violent tumble that started when he and Tim Richmond rushed together. He walked away with the help of his mate, Tim Richmond, from that mangled number two. And that's a team owner's worst nightmare. Both cars go into the first turn at Pocono. Tangle, one of them goes upside down, end over end. You watch one of your two drivers help the other one limp off. That was a Bud Moore car that he was driving there, the 15 car. Got up against the wall, and Tim Richmond's car was so close on it that it actually catapulted him upside down there. Earnhardt will start in 11. And here's Kenny Schrader, who is qualified third for the Pennsylvania 500, back for a little more tweaking in the garage. Twenty-two minutes left. We need to give those times when you can. If you yeah, I'm, in I'm doing it when I can hear it, but that's the first one I've heard. What? Count from there. Maybe 21 20... when we get back. Well, yeah, I suppose. Barry, we'll start this sucker. No, <laughs> you know what? Nobody even said why they clean the coolers, but the reason for it: metal shavings. When a gear goes mm -hmm, out, mm -hmm. there's a lot of metal shavings in there, and they just take the next gear and wind it right out too. But we won't get into that. Sammy Johns. I love that shot just of him talking with the guy. Yes. yes. A piece of wet. They say it again. That's great. Mm -hmm. He's fixing to check out and go do what he told him. Uh huh. Goodbye. <clears throat> I could tell that by body language. The foot was turning. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep, that's fine. Sammy Johns, the crew chief for Ken Schrader, doing what everybody's doing. That's checking the times that are up on the practice results at 165.502. He's looking at Ward Burton on top. He has been in serious conversation with Ken Schrader. Schrader just pulled back in. 
he wants some adjustments on that car. Schrader wants this Pennsylvania 500 bad tomorrow. Sammy Johns is crew chief. So much responsible as crew chiefs always are when you get down to Winston Cup racing. Now you see back on the track, all those changes, that three or four days at your local garage done in what, about 20 minutes? Yeah, 25? About. Yep, changed yep. the whole rear gear set. And on the track is Dale Jarrett, ready to give it another try. You know what I was really impressed with? And the reason he's a points leader right now, he was calm and cool through that whole exchange there where they were changing the gear, getting ready to go back on the racetrack. He didn't panic. He didn't get the crew in a panic. He just sat there. You have to be very, very clever to win the Western Cup championship. And the reason that he does not give the championship away is for that reason. He's very, very calm. Well, the driver is really the emotional leader of most of the teams that are out here. And the way he behaves, both in the garage and on the racetrack, has a lot to do with the performance of the rest of the team. Dale Jarrett had one of his greatest moments, Pepsi 4. He's had some great moments at Daytona, won that 500. But that Pepsi 400 running out of fuel on fumes as he came across the finish line will be one that most folks will never forget. In victory lane, Ned Jarrett was with his son when it was over. Well, it wasn't there. He was, he was there. there. Take my it. word for it. Yeah, he was standing right beside him. Well, he's ahead in this shot. He'll probably be ahead tomorrow as well. Dale Jarrett has won two of the last four July races that have been run here at Pocono. Boy, if anybody's got this place figured out, it's DJ. Let's go to Mike Hogwood. Uh, we're with John Andretti. There's another crew member in his car who's had a flashlight. Uh, what is happening in this part of happy hour here, John Andretti? Oh, um, I don't know. We seem to be going through a couple of different things, but... Um, the, the ball and the shifter, we, we changed shifter levers because um, I like, I, I wanted to get back for a little bit further so it'd be easier to shift and uh, and the ball and the new lever fell off so we were looking for it. Searching all through <laughs> this car for the ball of the shifter lever. They got a guy in here with a flashlight. Well, talk about running out on the racetrack. How is this 40 pair? The STP Pontiac I think is um, is pretty good. We're, um, we feel really good and um, feel good about the race. Uh, I hope that it stays running like it is right now because um, the car's real comfortable and um, and we're, I don't know, who knows, maybe we might have something for some of them tomorrow, but um, I don't know about the win, but we're in the right place at the right time, who knows. Feeling good and he's hoping there's not a little ball rattling around when he runs back out on the racetrack. Jeff Gordon had that Pepsi can rattling around <laughs> all over America and that number 24. He just needs a cup holder, that's all. Here's Mark Martins, number six, just rolling in after turning some laps. He's been second quick at 165.444 in race trend for tomorrow's Pennsylvania 500. Yeah. That'd be good. Sure. I was oh, here. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yep. They came by the tens. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That looks good.
some of the stuff sure for we the charlotte can, thing if we, we can use it what else should we be doing yeah The faithful are gathering in the Pocono Mountains and by tomorrow some 150,000 strong to see the stars of the Winston Cup in competition. This is the Winston Cup Series second visit to the Pocono Raceway. If today's tomorrow's race is anything like June's race, it's going to be something to see. At the start, five wide, but it's the green car of Bobby Labonte out for the lead. Early trouble. Lap three. Wally Dolan back. Jeff Burton get together. Heavy damage on the 99 car. Burton would finish 36. Lap nine. Rusty Wallace blew a tire. Slammed the wall. He was unhurt, but out of competition early. First round of green flag pit stop. Chad Little lost control of his John Deere and hit the wall. Ward Burton in the yellow and black Pontiac led for a time. Frightening crash just short of halfway. Dave Marcus spun and hit the wall and turned two. Marcus shaken, but not badly injured. During the next 50 laps, Mark Martin led. Dale Jarrett, Jeremy Mayfield, Jeff Gordon. 154 laps complete and Michael Waltrip is tapped by Bill Elliott. Hit the wall. This caution allows the leaders to top off the gas, and Bobby Labonte right here takes four tires. On lap 172, hometown favorite Jimmy Spencer excited the crowd by passing leader Jeff Gordon, assuming the top spot. Spencer held the advantage until with only 14 laps to go, his car slipped in some oil. There's Bobby Labonte into the lead. Six laps to go. Ward Burton, Johnny Benson, John Andretti came together to bring out the last of the 11 cautions. Labonte broke clean on the restart and took the win. The first career win for Bobby Labonte at Pocono. It all happens again tomorrow, starting at 12.35 on the Superstation, Pennsylvania 500. Question, can defending champion Jeff Gordon repeat? We'll find out tomorrow on the Superstation. Or can this man, Bobby Labonte, Win it back to back. Won it in June in great style. He's qualified outside of the second row. What do you think his chances are, guys? They're good. There's no question about it. Unfortunately, he is not bringing the same car back that he had the win with here in June. That car was demolished at New Hampshire a couple of weeks ago. But Gordon's definitely the right guy to watch. He's gotten the last eight races here. He's been second or first in seven of them. Bobby Labonte, if it comes down to saving fuel, I guarantee you he's the guy to watch because he won a race already this year by being very easy on the throttle and knowing how to conserve fuel. How about his teammate? Now, we know there aren't team rules in this deal like there are in some other forms of racing. I mean, it's every man for himself when they drop the green. What do you guys think about Stewart tomorrow show? Well, they call him Tony the Tiger, and he is everything that Bobby Labonte is not. He does not save fuel. He's hard on the gas in the middle of the corner. He uses a little more fuel than Bobby Labonte does, even though the motors are very similar. He uses up more car? Yes, he does. Well, one thing that they have in common is that they're both winners for sure, and he Stewart hasn't won yet in Winston Cup other than at the Winston Open in Charlotte in May, but he is long overdue to win one, and it could well be tomorrow. He is strong enough to do it for sure. The 18 and the 20, team cars for a proven champion, Joe Gibbs. Moved it with a Super Bowl three times. There you see that Bobby Labonte car and some of the others that are cracking here today. 
and they are together. There's the 20 just in front of the 18. You see Tony Stewart down there in turn number one. Will it be his day, his first Winston Cup victory tomorrow? It's going to be a fun race to watch. I'm going to tell you, I thought he was going to win. He ran, you know, in Indianapolis, then comes to the World 600 in Charlotte, leads a lot of that race, and everybody said, this might be the day that Tony Stewart does it. Then at Loudon, they said the same thing. Led 118 he's, laps. Yeah, he's overdue. NASCAR has just come on the radio and told all the teams that there are just 10 minutes left of this practice session. Not Last much time to, chance. Yeah, not much time to get them dialed in now. Looks as if Tony Stewart's on a run to test fuel mileage. And some of these guys will go far enough to actually run the car out of gas. See how far it'll go. Last chance to see just how strong that rocket's going to be tomorrow. Randy Pemberton. The backup car of the 21 team, the Wood Brothers team, Morgan Shepard now aboard after driving this ride for several years on the Winston Cup circuit. He happens to be here this weekend in good timing as Elliot Sadler got into a, a, a crash here during second uh, round of qualifying here this afternoon. We'll step over and grab Elliot real quick. Elliot, you got a pretty good limp. Morgan's in the car. How are you? We're okay uh, out there. Just struggling with the car a little bit. We're going to let Morgan get some time in there just in case for tomorrow. And also try to help me out a little bit. I just can't seem to get a hang of this place, and he's been around here a lot of times, so maybe he'll be able to help us out a lot. We just want to do what's best for the whole Sitco Ford racing team here, and uh, hopefully he'll be able to help us out right here. Is it just experience uh, on this racetrack that's tough for you? I think it is. I just can't get the car to comfortable to be good for all three corners. Everybody knows at home these three corners are a lot different. you got to have a happy medium, and uh, just can't find a happy medium I want right now, so uh, maybe that'll be something Morgan will to help us with. Okay, he's trying to brush off the injuries, and uh, Morgan Shepard, as he said, in the car. Couldn't have a better one. Boy, I tell you, that sounds like a guy that knows where he's going in the sport. He's won five Bush Grand National uh, races, and, you know, he was a champion at South Boston, his home track, and the Wood Brothers are high on what he's going to be later on. Got to be something in the water with South Boston. You got the Burtons, you got the Sadler brothers. Those guys are racers. Yeah, they are, but this place is so tough, and they don't run the Bush Series here, so when a guy like Elliot Sadler comes, he really doesn't have any experience here. Neither did Tony Stewart, and when he came to Pocono for the first time, it was a practice session. He demolished the car in the tunnel turn. As you watch these cars and as you watch these drivers, consider that these are the 43 best chairs there are in stock car racing. NASCAR has over 100 short tracks. They sanction all over the country. They run every Saturday night or Friday night. And it is the dream of every driver on every one of those tracks and every division that someday, somehow, they will find their way into these chairs. This is the top of the order. And when you get here, it is special. And so those folks in South Boston, Virginia, they're going to truck off down to the South Boston Speedway tonight. You can bet your boots that if they are not here at Pocono, they're going to watch that Sadler kid, see if he can pull it off again, those Burton brothers, see if they can get themselves back and have another win. Both Ward and Jeff are proven winners. It's, it's fun because all over the United States, where do you go to Vermont or Virginia or California? Those short tracks are where you develop the support for these great superstars, and when you get here, just as qualified means you're somebody special. We'll be back in a moment with Buddy Baker and Dr. Dick Berger. Morgan Shepard out. We'll see him run in a moment. Now, that's what you do best. Yes, you can't do it all day. Yeah, yeah. I can. could listen to it all day. No, I I yes, could. You could. No, you yes, you could. Yes, you could. I tell you what, the people 18 get awful sick of that. I was just fixing to say every man coming down that front straightaway that you're looking at started on a short track. They don't start on this type of racetrack. I guarantee the 18 and 20 are doing a fuel check. What? You might have, huh? They tore up a bunch of stuff over there. I heard about him running over there when he's playing football in high school. 
They're not actually racing. Oh, he practiced. He done everything. Practice, practice, yes. He never raced. Uh, I think he did. I, he claims he didn't. I'll tell you what, I, I, I will find out for sure. But right. I'm, I just about bet. I know he te uh, tested right, a bunch. A dollar, a dollar. No, he tested a bunch. Five minutes. Yeah. Ooh, that's the story. Yeah, well, but you need to give us that 21 car. It didn't come out. It's still in the... Well, he's, he's, he's not going to make it. He's Maybe. Yeah, car. he don't need a... He's already been on a track know that, in the 91. Gonna... He's, he's got to make it to run the car tomorrow. He must practice it. He's already been out there in the 91, though. He has time on the track. Yeah. Yeah. Less than five minutes remains in this final last chance opportunity to get your car ready for the Pennsylvania 500 tomorrow. 105, they'll drop the green. We'll be with you at 12.35 for all the pre-race celebrations. And it's always a big one here, as it is at every Winston Cup race. This has been the fastest car in this happy hour period. Whoop. Whoa, quite a wiggle in that fastest <laughs> car. Grab that cat by the tail. Right now, the top speed is not what they're really looking for. They want to dial the car in, particularly on old tires, if they possibly can. Get that car squared away so when the end of the day comes, it's going to be as fast as possible. 165, 502. That's the quickest lap turn. And the number 22, Ward Burton, has been the fellow to pick it out here. Take a look at this. Ward Burton gets a big wiggle there in the tunnel turn. Got it back straight. But you have... This is not the moment when you want to throw one away. And Morgan Shepard, there's the 22 car. There's the 21 car out now, and that is Morgan Shepard in it as we see Sterling Marlin scooting by. Remember, he has the track record, Sterling does, at 170.5 and change. Didn't do it this time, last time here. Morgan Shepard back at work. Boy, I tell you what, it won't take him long to get back in the groove either. He's a very talented driver, and he knows how to run this racetrack very well. So. The combination of the Wood Brothers, Morgan Shepard, hey, they might do something more. Mike Hogwood. Well, we're out on pit road where the Goodyear engineers as well as team crew members are testing the tire temperatures. Uh, this is done to make sure the camber is correct and to see how much wear is going on the tires out on the racetrack. They also take the temperatures of the track. And just for your information, it's 118 degrees here on the racetrack. That's pretty cool. Yesterday, the track temperature was 133. You're looking at the car of Rusty Wallace, who, as uh, we said, had made a lot of adjustments on his car, and so he is wanting to know how that affects the tire temperatures. As you see his crew members putting that little needle on the tires, which registers the temperature, then they make notes, and then they'll go back in the garage and discuss how it has affected the car. And if you look really carefully, see the man with the blue shirt? That's Derek Dong, and he is a brake expert. And he's got a temperature gauge with a long probe on it. He was sticking that thing through the wheel to measure the temperature of the brakes to see how they were working as well. And that's new technology. We used to use different paint colors, to, and it would show up as how much heat you were running on the brakes. Now they have a probe. And what they're doing here with the tire temperatures, these guys run the cars so hard that they actually slide them just a tad through the corner. That puts absolute pressure on all the tires. If you've got one tire that's running a little bit hotter than the other, it's working too hard. So the mechanics will try to adjust the car and get the tire temperatures on all four as evenly as possible. That's Kevin LePage's number 16. To go a little bit further with that, like if the right front is running a lot of temperature, that means it's actually losing grip and sliding across the racetrack. Right rear, if it's hot, that means the back end sliding out. If the left rear is too hot, that means it's not getting forward right. End of the final minute of happy hour. Well, Checking Derek, on Jeremy Mayfield. Derek measuring brake temperatures again. Writing them all down, seeing which brakes are working better. What's a good brake temperature? 
you just want to make sure that you don't have too much temperature to burn the pads out, and that has happened here at Poker. They use a lot of brake going into turn one. How hot is it? They use asbestos uh, gloves, a, a specially prepared glove. I've seen it burn through them. That's how hot the brakes can get. That's hot. You got it. We're down to the final moments. We're going to see the flags thrown in just a moment to complete this final practice period before the 26th annual Pennsylvania 500 tomorrow. Do hope you're going to be with us. Enjoy it. You're not going to have a seat in the grandstand. That straightaway you're looking at, if you're just joining us, is 3,700 feet long. It is the longest piece of pavement in NASCAR racing. And it's a lot of fun to get into, but when you get down to the end, as the red and black are being extended to finish the day, if you can't roll that car, put that 3,400 pounds very neatly and nicely and with all the precision of a surgeon into turn one, you're in a big world of hurt. You don't have to worry about turns two and three. If you don't <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Good night, nurse. We'll talk to some of the drivers after they have completed this run. See how they feel about running the Pennsylvania 500 tomorrow at Pocono. <laughs> that was real good. That was real good. <laughs> I tell you, this sick man behind these eyes, you know it. <laughs> I'm glad he said it. A yeah. very sick man. Mm -hmm. Boy, look at him he all. He said he liked me better before I learned now. to read. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is when you really, really, really. Yeah. This is when you decide whether it's happy or bad hour. Roof cam. You know what? I wouldn't mind seeing it if Mark Martin goes directly yeah. in. Yeah, just panned out. There's there's a dozen or so out there. Yeah, it's it's terrific. Yeah, there's Victory Lane. There's the whole thing. This is what they're going for. Nice they're on the checkered flag, the whole thing. And they're all trying to get to this place tomorrow yeah, afternoon. Yeah. When did you do that, we do it. <laughs> you see them all lined up. They only have one goal tomorrow, and that's to get right there. Yeah. Right in there. Yeah. <laughs> Victory? What is that? That's not circle. Victory yeah, it is. Vic that's victory, victory oval. Victory oval. oval. Yeah. <laughs> victory lane's good. I like that. Yeah, but that. that's oh. no lane, though. No. Oval. Yeah, that's that's nice victory. Yeah. Victory oval. <laughs> yeah. There they are. Uh, out. Uh, oh, darn it. We missed it. If you haven't get back in, we'll do it again. Turned out to be a beautiful afternoon. They had predicted showers, said we might not get this race in that we had, the ARCA 200, which was a dandy and Blaze Alexander one. But now, this vast array of trailers and campers are going to settle down. Happy hour is over. Have a great evening of celebration, telling stories about the races they've seen this year and yesteryear. And as you look down here on Pitt Road, there you see the finish line area along Pitt Road. And the tire testing, the tire checking continues there. And as you look down there, there's the spot, the one that means the most. Right there. That's what everybody's working for tomorrow afternoon, to end up in Winter Circle. Lion's share of uh, $2 million. Oval here. Didn't put a circle. They put an <laughs> oval in. Look at that. Pretty fancy. Yeah. Oh, those Mattiolis. There are the folks, Dr. Mattioli and uh, Dr. Rose Mattioli as well, his wife, Joe and Rose, have done such a great job with this race facility. And it's where we'll be tomorrow, topside, for this Pennsylvania 500. How now, you, you say, that's probably it. This means that they don't have any more work on the cars. They'll go home tonight and have a meeting with all the crew and everything. They'll go over every note. What do we need to change? A lot of cars will make changes in the morning and go on the racetrack unproven. And you get out here tomorrow morning at what time, Dick? 7 o'clock, and the crews will be lined up at the garage waiting for it to open so they can get in and go to work as soon as possible. This is the neatest part of Pocono. These people right here 
they're there, they can see the drivers, the drivers come out, there's little places in this fence there that the drivers actually come out and sign autographs for the fans. It's a little like Texas. Standing around on a Texas this year, there must have been 400 fans, and every car that went by got applauded. It was like their own special little parade for these guys, the guys that do all the work, most of them relatively unknown, but love this game just as much as those who will cinch it up tomorrow and go for the headlines. There's the guy that has the headline right now. That's Mike Skinner. Third career pole for Susanville, California runner. What a story he is. When he was a kid, his mother worked in a tavern. And he shot pool to earn the money for the tires he put on the race car. And race he did all the way through high school. And he's raced himself all the way from Susanville, California, to the big time. Watch for him tomorrow on the pole. And, you know, he's another who has never won a points-paying Winston Cup race. Another guy who could be a first-time winner here at Pocono tomorrow. Father Baker? Yeah, and he was 13th quickest uh, today in, in uh, what we call happy hour. Steve Burns? Hey, thanks, Ken Squire. Well, Rusty Wallace has suited up, so let's find out, guys, if it really has been a happy hour. Well, I know for myself, it got a lot happier those last 10 minutes. I was a little concerned up to that, but uh, it's amazing what a shock and a spring, a little wedge of due to these cars to wake them up. My car seems to be pretty good right now. I got Tony Stewart here with me. Tony, how's your car? Well, I think we got a little bit better. Uh, this morning wasn't real good, but uh, this afternoon, I think we made some pretty big gains here. I mean, it's, we're kind of chasing the, the same thing everybody else is. After the Hoosier rubber, everybody's kind of finding out what their cars are doing at the beginning. And then, like you said, I mean, we made some changes there the last 15, 20 minutes, and all of a sudden, the car came to life and gained about a half a second. So uh, we're going to make a couple more changes before tomorrow, but I think we're going to be okay. Let me tell you what, when you make some changes, you gain a half a second, you want to make some more changes. No <laughs> doubt about that. Now, here's a guy that's been doing great all year long, one of my favorites. And I'll tell you what, I guarantee you, two weeks ago, he'd have gave me $5,000 for a gallon of gas, wouldn't you? I'd give you $10,000 for a gallon. <laughs> you got some money on you right now? $20. You got some money? Let me see. He's carrying $20 for gasoline, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere he goes. If he'd have had just a squeeze... A lap and a half on a mile and a half track, he would have won his first Winston Cup race. Instead, it was shake and bake and not come up with a single thing. Rolled it around, and it was not to happen. Randy Pemberton? I went seven time with the cup champ. He's saying hurry. <laughs> He's trying to get out of the racetrack. Hey, Dale, uh, happy hour concluded. I, I, you don't seem thrilled about it. What, what about the condition of your car? No, I'm not in a hurry to get out of it. I'm in a hurry to get in the truck and talk to Kevin to come up with a master plan here to uh, just straighten this race car out. Last race up here, we weren't in good shape in the last practice either, and we made some pretty uh, gutsy changes, and the car was decent. We ended up seventh in the race, and this is a different car than I brought here uh, last time, so uh, it's not doing what I want it to do, and I've been sort of ill because it won't do what I want it to do, and it's a better race car, I think, and it's not doing what it should do, so we're going to uh, change some pretty drastic things on the front of it. Uh, radiator and air, oil cooler and stuff like that and change the taping on that way we can change the taping on the front to help the downforce or or hurt the downforce but i think it'll help it and uh, then uh, come up with a, a super duper spring and bar setup and shocks and go in there and go race but uh, we did the same thing the last race and we felt pretty good about it we know really where we should be and we just can't get there from there here and uh, we just got to make some adjustments so we can so it's just uh, not really a guessing game but it's going to be a, a mystery shuffle Good luck in getting the setup. Uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. To Rusty Wallace. Hey, guys, I got my teammate with me, Jeremy Mayfield. I know we're running out of time, so I want to say the best for last. He's got a real good car. He's been running good all week long. In fact, right at the end, my car wasn't as good as I wanted to. Jeremy says his shocks were really good. I borrowed his shocks, put them on my car. Man, my car took off. So that's where teamwork really plays in. And, Jeremy, what do you think of your car today? Man, I'm real happy, Russ, just like you are. You know, the, it's probably the best I've been in a long time anywhere. And uh, this feels good to start running good again, you know, and be back up there and have at least a shot at it. Well, I tell you, we talk about confidence. Jeremy's here with the same car he won his very first race with last year. And I know as a driver, when you get to bring a car back that you won with, that made you famous, right? Exactly. You're pretty proud of that old hot rod. So he's got it here, and it's going good for him today. Back to you guys. Yeah, and he won it right here at Pocono. Jeremy Mayfield, another one of those Owensboro racers. Mike Hogwood. Thanks, Ken. And uh, Dale Jarrett, tell us about your happy hour. You, you pleased with the car? You ready to go tomorrow? Uh, the car's okay. Uh, got to probably make a few small changes, just what we learned there and we'll go back and, and look at uh, this morning's practice and uh, but we got a pretty good race car this point of the year we're past the halfway mark you're the points leader any conservative thoughts at all as you go to the race you know 
to, to keep it up there? No, none at all. We've got to try to win races. Uh, that's what the guys right behind us are going to be trying to do, and we have to do the same thing. That's what got us in this position is trying to win races, and that's what we'll continue to do. All right, watch out for the 88 car tomorrow. For much of America in racing, Earnhardt's the name. He's the man. Will he be tomorrow? Will Dale Jarrett, the point leader, continue to sustain that drive toward the national championship, which his dad won twice? Will we see Mike Skinner from the front row win a point race for the first time? He's won a couple of exhibition races in Japan. He wants it bad. And how about Mark Martin? What a dramatic story there. Schrader and Labonte for row two when they drop the green tomorrow shortly after one o'clock. Here's row three. We'll be with you at 1235 for part of the pre-race story here at the Pocono Raceway, this great two and a half mile track where the most competitive racers in the world, the stars of the Winston Cup Series, will get it on. A final thought from Buddy Baker today. We're looking at him, Tony Stewart. I think he's gonna be a player. I Nick Bergren. I don't think he can go wrong. No matter what happens tomorrow, it's gonna be a great race. Always is at Pocono, very competitive racetrack. 43 of them are lining up tomorrow. 43 of them will do it again as they do 43 times a year. It is the most successful form of American racing, the most watched and the most admired superstars of motorsport. All in one group at every single track, whether it's a half mile, three quarter mile, two and a half mile, whatever the size, they all show up and give you their best. We hope you'll be here to see their best tomorrow on the Superstation. Rounding out the field as we look at those provisional starters, Jerry Nadu, who moves on next year, gets a ride with the Rick Hendricks stable, an old DW, a Darryl Wall Triple Run Shotgun. So, for Dick Bergren, Buddy Baker, Randy Pemberton, Mike Hogwood, and Steve Burns, I'm Ken Squire saying so long from Pocono, Pennsylvania. Coming up next is the TVS Super Shop. And coming up later tonight, Sylvester Stallone stars in Rocky III. WCW's Kevin Nash and the actor Michael McKinnon will be watching on Movie Lounge. That's tonight, 10 o'clock Eastern, on the Superstation. Tomorrow, it's the Pennsylvania 500, starting at 1235. Jeff Gordon, the defending champion, will be starting seventh. So long, everybody.